A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. When Paul and Silas, with Paul and Silas, we came to Philippi in Macedonia, a Roman colony. And as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divin divination <coughs> and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, these men are slaves of the most high God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days. But Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, these men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crown joined in attacking them, and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was an earthquake, so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prisoner, prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, and you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. The word of the Lord. The Lord is king, let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of the isles be glad. The heavens declare his righteousness and all the people see his glory. Zion hears and is glad and the cities of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O Lord. For you are the Lord, most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. The Lord loves those who hate evil. He preserves the lives of his saints and delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light has sprung up for the righteous and joyful gladness for those who are true-hearted. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give thanks to his holy name. A reading from the Revelation to John. At the end of the visions, I, John, heard these words. See, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, to repay according to everyone's work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they will have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. It is I, Jesus, who sent my angel to you with this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, 
come, and let everyone who hears say, come, and let everyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who wishes take the water of life as a gift. The one who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all the saints. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory to you, O Christ. As he was pray, praying, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them. And they have received them and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine. I have been glorified in them, and now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, Protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. The gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Please be seated. Good morning. Good to see you all this morning. I understand that today is Mother's Day. Is that correct? Happy Mother's Day, gentlemen. I hope that you kiss your wives and call your mothers today. And I hope um, we all remember that we all came here sort of through the same way. So there is a certain celebration today, even though it is the Lord's Day, of life given to us through the womb of a mother. So God bless you women. I am... Um, I'm struck this week by a couple of things that have been rolling through my mind. You've heard me talk a little bit about disruption in the, in the, in the last few weeks. And um, as we hear in the gospel from John this morning, Jesus' prayer um, of unity, uh, it, it's not just about Christian unity either. This is about unity for all people everywhere, all over the world, period. No exclusions, no excuses, nobody's left out. This is a wholeness and completeness that God alone can wish for, and we are doing our best to be open to that vision. But as I think about the notions of disruption and how they often are, how we are transformed, not in our comforts. You've heard me speak about this a little bit in the last few weeks, but anyway, this story from, from Acts this morning is, is quite powerful. 
Um, and and it, it really is quite a different version of conversion than, than, than we normally hear. You, you heard it, the reading from Acts is, um, there's this slave girl, in other words, she's owned by another human being. We won't talk about how just flat out wrong that is. But anyway, she's owned by another group of people. She is, a, she is an investment. She is a profit maker for them. Um, and she's falling around behind Paul and Silas and screaming out that these people are godly men. And it's just about to drive Paul batty. So on his very last nerve, he turns around to her and says, come out, or whatever they do. <laughs> and, you know, get out of her. And she comes out. Well, then all of a sudden, her, after she's lost her spirit of divination, which is the demon, um, then, then her, the people who own her, uh, the profiteers, the entrepreneurs, if you wanted to use a good word for them, those, those folks think, this is just not right. This is not peace. This is not the way things are supposed to be doing. Our exploitative profit structures have been exposed for what they are, and somebody must pay for this. And so they concoct a story, and they go to the leaders of the, of the city and say, these people were disturbing the peace. Yeah, their peace and their money profit system. And so they want them kicked out or imprisoned, um, which sounds a little bit not like just the first century. Right. So they do go to prison because this concocted story of disturbing the peace catches hold with the crowd, and the crowd starts saying, "Yeah, send those guys to jail. Send those guys to jail." So they go to jail, and um, and at midnight there is this earthquake, and um, somehow everybody's chains are un unloosed, and um, and everybody starts walking out of the prison. Uh, or at least that's what the guard thinks. And so the guard, knowing that he's responsible for their, for keeping them as prisoners, um, he starts to turn his sword on himself, which is exactly what would have, they would have been uh, required to do at that time. They would have been put to death anyway. So he starts to turn the sword on himself. It's, it's a pretty harsh reality it, back, back then in, 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 in the Roman structure of things. Um, Roman soldier structure of things. So he starts to turn the, cell, the sword on himself, and, and Paul says, no, don't do that. We're still here. And so for some reason, somehow, at least as the story goes, it seems that that is moving to, to the guard, and he runs up, he walks out with them as the story goes, and he runs up to them and says, tell me what I must do to be saved. Now, the word there uh, for, for saved, and you've heard this a lot of times from me because I, I like the connection. Uh, the word there um, for saved in, in the New Testament is, is the Greek word sozo, um, which also means to be healed. And so he runs up and says, tell me what I must do to be healed. And Paul says, believe in God. It is, quite frankly, probably, probably the shortest conversion story in all of the New Testament and probably the most simple. What do I need to do to be saved? Just believe. Whew, man, I thought I had to do something, really, like, you know, Hail Marys or, I don't know, go feed the poor or something. No, you just believe that God is your Savior and that God is redeeming the structures and the people, all people of this world, and you will be in... So I'm feeling kind of like a rock star. <laughs> you see this? You can't see it, can you? You can stand up and look, but I'm like in the, I'm like in the spotlight here. <laughs> I'm like Bono on stage for you too, right? Sorry, that was a little sidetrack. That's not part of a sermon. <laughs> so just believe. Believe that God is at work in this world and that God is here to heal and to save us and you will be, you will be saved. It's, it's, a it's a fabulous notion, is it not? Just that all there is to do is to just believe. It's wonderful. And there's a few problems with it. Um, the first problem is, and, and this is not new, is that oftentimes we, we, we Christians um, seem to think that conversion uh, is, is something that we are forced to do in God's name for the love of another. And so we walk around this earth being complete and total jackasses to other people in the name of Jesus, expecting them to want to be like we are. 
And you can see why some of them would say, I'm just not buying that that's the whole godly love thing. Perhaps there is an, another way. And so we have this sort of, we have this notion, of, uh, even in our evangelism, we have this notion of, of, of love through conversion. Not conversion through love. We, we want to convert people so that they'll know we love them. And perhaps what we might do is love them and allow them to choose God, to choose love, to know that they are not forced into anything. But when we go around forcing people into a box that we have created for them, then it's hardly loving and it hardly makes us one. So there's that side of it. And then the other side of it is this, is that oftentimes as simple as we make the word belief, it's just not that simple because life is hard and life is difficult and relationships are difficult and things happen in this world and people die and relationships dissolve and earthquakes happen and you just name your long list, tornadoes happen east of here, whatever it is, um, things explode. and pe- So we, we begin to think that perhaps this whole trusting in God thing is not actually getting us where we want to be because people are continuing to sort of leave this world and relationships are starting to devolve, and dis- devolve or dissolve. And so it's, it just doesn't seem like this whole belief thing is actually working out for us in terms of our healing and wholeness when separation seems to be the name of the game most of the time as we view our world. So it's not quite as simple, is it, as you just believe. It's all good. The notion that the Christian life is simple, if you've been paying attention to anything that's happened in Acts, has completely been turned upside down. Let me tell you just a little bit about what happens when you commit your heart and your soul and your life to Jesus. One, you will most definitely be arrested if your name is Paul. Two, you will probably get wrecked if you get on a ship. Three, if you go calling out Jesus in public, somebody's going to call you a fraud and you're going to go to jail yet again. And four, you just might find that if you commit your heart to Jesus and you stick to it, you're going to spend the rest of your living days under some sort of oppressive regime. Now, that's just the way it works in Acts. You can figure out how it works for you in this world, in in the here and now. The point is, is it's just not as easy as what we make it seem. So what is, how is this whole notion of conversion, to work for us? How is the notion of love to work for us? How might we, like that guy who said, how can I be saved? How might we enter into a place of healing in this world that is not just about us and those of us in this room or about the Christians or about one area? How might we enter into some healing that is real and true and whole as in the whole planet? which is where this prayer of Jesus comes in. Holy Father, my deepest prayer is that they all may be one. It's not about Christian unity, as I said. This is about a world uniting in love. And it is not a new concept now. It's not, wasn't when Jesus first said it, he was only mirroring and reflecting the love that he had experienced through God and with his own disciples. And not only that, it's never been forgotten, really. In 1886, and you can verify this if you turn to page 876 in the back of your prayer book, there was this gathering of bishops in Chicago, and they compiled this thing called the Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral, which is, those, which is four things that they thought might be helpful in bringing us to some sort of unity among the Christian church so that we might realize the mission of God and unity for all people in the rest of the world. And I just want to tell you briefly what those things are, and then I want to backtrack just a second. Um, One is that Holy Scripture really is important to us as Christians, and that there is some peace in there for us of real healing and real wholeness 
as found in the story of God with God's people and as found in the story of Jesus and his disciples and as found in the stories of Jesus and his healings and all those things that we hold to be the word is authoritative scripturally in our, in our lives. There is power basically in scripture too. There is something for us in the sacramental life of our worship. There is something deeply deeply foundational in our baptismal and sacramental Eucharistic life because we are baptized into God, into his life and death, and by that life and death and new life, again, we are called into something larger, larger than ourselves. They also affirm the Nicene Creed as not the only statement of the Christian faith, but as a sufficient one. In other words, it says enough. If you want to say it as a community, it says quite a plenty for us to gather around and to unite behind each, with each other in mission and, and go forward. And then the sticky part was this, and I'll just tell you, and we won't talk much about it, but the sticky part was they also affirmed the historic episcopate, or as one of our teenagers called it right before she was confirmed, um, the Jesus chain. Um, so the Jesus chain is this notion that from going from now all the way back to the time of Jesus, there has been a passing on of the Spirit or a laying on of hands, if you will, from the apostles to now. And that historically is an unbroken chain, which is something that we can't really verify, but we're going to stick to it, by God, because we're good Episcopalians. So anyway, that has, that has created somewhat of, of a rift in the, in the Christian community um, for, uh, for a long time. So this whole Chicago Lambeth quadrilateral was born out of the vision, not really the vision, born out of the vision of God. If anything, it, it was, there was one man, though, who thought that perhaps the unity of a world might actually um, come together if first the Christians looked like they were united and then others might follow. And his name, this guy's name was William Reed Huntington, and he's the one who came up um, not just with these four things, um, but he came up with something that preceded those four things, which really is the heart and soul of the Christian life. And so as a, a, little, as a little precursor to the four things, he said this. He wrote, and the bishops affirmed, I quote, turn to page 876 if you don't believe me. Um, it is our earnest prayer earnest desire, excuse me, it is our earnest desire that our Savior's prayer, quote, that we all may be one, end quote, may in its deepest and its truest sense be speedily fulfilled. It is our earnest desire that our Lord's prayer that we all may be one may in its deepest and truest sense be speedily fulfilled. That is the heart and soul of Christian worship in at least one sentence that unity reign, that our Lord's prayer does come true So that prayer that you heard this morning from the Gospel of John is Jesus letting the world fall away for a minute and taking a deep spiritual breath. Maybe we can do the same. Taking a deep spiritual breath and expressing the deepest desire of his little Savior's heart. His mother would be very proud that all people everywhere in the love and in the salvation and the healing of God, that all people would be one, one flock under one shepherd, no matter what religion they are or what church they go to or what color they are, or anything you can think of in its deepest and truest sense our Lord's prayer 
is a plea to us with God's help to continue to work for justice and for peace. To not sit and to hope that God will one day just figure it all out for us, but to work for unity for all people. Now, you can say that that is a very lofty, lofty endeavor. And it is a much easier thing for all of us to say, well, instead of unity, why don't we just work for, towards some kind of, I don't know, confident, as I've heard recently, confident pluralism, you know, where we all just kind of coexist with each other and we tolerate each other in, with some humility and some patience. Now, that's not too bad. It sounds awesome, actually. Just tolerance. Tolerance is awesome. Tolerance, humility, patience, that'll save the world. Not exactly. The only thing, the only one who can save a world that is ridden with greed and darkness and hatred is the one who knows only love and whose deepest desire is for us to know that love and to live it. Living love is not an easy endeavor. It not only takes our prayers, but it takes God's as well. May we all be one. Amen. If you'll please stand. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. Please stand. Peace of the Lord be always with you.